Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing fantastic. We're continuing our reading of Frederick Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra. And we were dealing with this section titled On Reading and Writing. Now, Nietzsche is a controversial figure for some. Witty, nonetheless. And I do enjoy reading him. Let's begin. Go ahead and listen to this as you're riding your bike. You're on your treadmill. You're fishing. Whatever fun thing it is you're doing. Let's begin. Whoever writes in blood and aphorisms does not want to be read, but to be learned by heart. Now that's interesting. Huh. Kind of dark. But let's see. In the mountains, the shortest way is from the peak to peak. But for that one must have long legs. <laughs> yeah, we got short legs, I'll tell you a while. Aphorisms should be peaks, and those who are addressed tall and lofty. Ooh, that's a, that's a nice one. Because when you say, it, like, tall and lofty, it's almost like people who are up in their stature of degree of understanding will be able to understand your aphorisms. The air thin and pure, danger near. And the spirit full of sarcasm. These go well together. I want to have goblins around me, for I am courageous. Now that's an interesting note. Wanting the goblins around just because you're courageous? I'd rather have someone say they want to conquer the goblins around them because they are courageous. Courage that puts ghosts to flight creates goblins for itself courage wants to laugh oh that's like the I laugh in the face of danger ha 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 bravery and courage but there comes a balance of recklessness if you don't have precaution oftentimes courage can be full heartedness if you don't make sure to measure it well now, if you're creating goblins for yourself, kind of be a bit weak, I'd argue, because you are creating a monster and then slaying it of your own imagination or your own bad behavior. You're creating more goblins than allies. I don't know how that would work out for you. I no longer feel as you do this cloud which I see beneath me, this blackness and gravity at which I laugh. This is your thundercloud. Okay, notice this. So, the cloud which I see beneath me is blackness and gravity at which I laugh. This is your thundercloud. So he's laughing at another person's thundercloud that is beneath him. And so, the thundercloud, when you originally hear it, it scares you. Crack! If you ever heard some thunder that just shot sometimes out of nowhere, it can spook you a bit. But what he's getting at is it doesn't matter he's not gonna be afraid of your storm because your storm is beneath him you look up when you feel the need for elevation and i look down because i am elevated <laughs> oh that's a clever one right there that's a clever one man now this is what i'm saying because <laughs> think about it i do both though I'll look up at the sky and be like, you know, I think about Allah, I think about my existence. But there are times where I'm walking and I'll just stare at the ground and like the whole world escapes and I'll be thinking of something and go off on a nice little reasoning trip. I'm sure you've had that as well. You get lost in thought. But it is quite fascinating where the gaze decides to rest, where it finds comfort in depending on your mood. Very fascinating. <laughs> Who among you can laugh and be elevated at the same time? Whoever climbs the highest mountains laughs at all tragic plays and tragic seriousness. Now that one almost reminds me of the Greek tragic plays. Notice this. Whomever climbs the highest mountains laughs at all tragic plays and tragic seriousness. So, you laugh at the good, 
and you laugh at the seriousness because sometimes all you can do is laugh if you're climbing the highest mountains you're gonna see things this is a metaphor it's almost symbolic right an allegory you have a lot going on here you're gonna struggle to get to something you're gonna head on up there you're gonna see things on the way up and you're gonna have to laugh sometimes at things that are quite tragic and serious in order to keep your sanity and keep on keeping on brave unconcerned mocking violent thus wisdom wants us she is a woman and always loves only a warrior now this this is where you get into some really needy stuff here now bravery going into wisdom I like how he phrased that wisdom is a woman and only wants the warrior because the warrior he has to be unconcerned sometimes yet concerned at the same time when he's charging on head first being brave or he's in a strategic position he forgets about sometimes his own risk yet is always knowing his own risk when he hears a noise over there or a noise over here he's paying attention but he's also focusing all this pressure of stimulation coming upon him that he almost becomes unconcerned in some ways yes warriors do have to be violent mocking yeah you've seen that someone takes the head throws it on the ground someone cuts out a horror someone ties a woman's hair to the back of a horse smacks the horse's bum the horse drags her through others i like for example Vercingetorix who led the Gauls when Caesar conquered him he paraded him naked through the streets and he was tied oh, I can't remember if it was on a contraption and paraded or walking behind the horse but either way the Romans when they had their triumphal parades would also display captives so there is an element of mocking there and even the Native American tribes when they wore they'd scalp the other hold up the, the tail you know the ponytail whatever They're like this is it so warriors do have an element of mocking their enemies once defeated you say to me life is hard to bear but why would you have your pride in the morning and your resignation in the evening life is hard to bear but do not act so tenderly we are all of us fair beasts a burden male and female asses what do we have in common with the rosebud which trembles because a drop of dew lies on it now that's interesting that is interesting life is hard to bear he's telling them why do you have this pride in the morning when you wake up and resignation in the evening could be the sapping of energy I'd argue and he says again someone says again life is hard to bear he's saying well don't don't, don't act so tenderly what I think is interesting about that is he's not saying not to be tender which leads to mercy but rather not overly tender which would be a pacifist today who thinks that you must always be peaceful under every condition which is definitely a lie now when he says fair beasts of burden another interesting example is the donkey because he says asses which is another word for donkeys and they are very loyal and can take a lot of weight and they don't make a lot of noise they hee-haw sometimes and they're quite funny but when you pack them up the donkey is very good as a companion for so many people for generations upon generations they are a beast of burden they carry the burdens of much and they don't tremble and their knees don't buckle as much unless you overpack them so his contrasting point here of the rosebud trembling with a drop of dew that is 
unique because the donkey, you can pack corn, put your baby on there, your your books. Donkey's gonna, as you pack it, he just holds still, you know, give him some grub. He doesn't tremble, but a delicate flower does. Something as light as water. That's quite fascinating. True, we love life, not because we are used to living, but because we are used to loving. That's interesting. What do you think? We love life because we are used to loving. It's not because we are used to living. Ah. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a good point. Like when you wake up, like I love my life. Is it life itself or the fact that you get to love throughout your life? Maybe that's why when you don't have love, you become nihilistic and cynical and a bitter feminist. <laughs> there is always some madness in love. That's, yeah, you really love a guy, you can go mad sometimes. But there is also always some reason in madness. Yeah, righteous indignation, righteous wrath. You can, yeah, there's madness in love and madness in reason. I agree. He's mad. And to me too, as I am well disposed toward life. Butterflies and soap bubbles and whatever among men is of their kind seem to know most about happiness. Seeing these light, foolish, delicate, Mobile little souls flutter. That seduces our thirsts of tears and songs. Hmm. Butterflies. Soap bubbles. And whatever he has here. That seems... Oh, okay. We got something going on here. Soap bubbles are light. They throw through the air. Kids love it. Kids absolutely love it. Air had a bubble machine. Kids go nuts. Butterflies. I've been seeing some beautiful monarch butterflies. Some pretty moths. And when they float, you see them and you kind of feel pity on them. And when some of them go into the road and there's cars passing by, you're like, get out of the butterfly. Go back to the flowers. And you don't want to see a butterfly get smushed. Like people who peel wings off of butterflies are quite cruel. And there's something inside of us, if I feel if you're not a sadist, if someone purposely like hurts a little tiny butterfly because they can catch it, you're kind of like, man, that's an a-hole move right there. Like, why you hurt that little butterfly? They're so cute and they're pollinators. So they float these butterflies carelessly. They get eaten by birds. But they're floating carelessly through life. And when you see them, you can't help but get a little bit of a perk. Especially if it's really beautiful. And kids love it as well. And so when he says, whatever among men that seems to know the most about happiness. A butterfly, does it know much about happiness? You wonder as it floats from beautiful flower to beautiful flower. Gracefully flapping its wings. Makes you think, doesn't it? And this is what he contends... Zarathustra is seduced by which makes him tear up and think of songs so what moves Zarathustra's heart is whatever brings about whatever it creature or substance something in that way because soap bubble isn't a creature it's a substance right soap and water right but something of that way that knows about happiness that moves him to be emotional. Whereas he laughs at other people's thunderstorms. Quite a contrast. I would believe in a god who could dance. And when I saw my devil, I found him serious. Now this is interesting. A god who dances and a devil who is serious. Huh. Depends on the type of dance, I'd argue. 
And a devil can definitely dance. Just look at strippers. Their seduction, the way they dance. The way a man can go into a trance and just throw all this money while people are starving just because he saw some boobs. That is satanic to me. The real profound and solemn, it was the spirit of gravity. Through him all things fall. Mm. See, that's an interesting thing. The spirit of gravity, through him all things fall. Rather, I would say the law of gravity, which is controlled by a loss of Hanawatal. By the permission of Allah, all things can fall through gravity. But I see the rhetorical thing he did here that's quite poetic. Not by wrath does one kill, but by laughter. Come, let us kill the spirit of gravity. So here, what do you say? That may not make sense at first, but gravity can make you feel weighted down. What goes up must come down. You try to jump, 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 you feel the weight coming down very quickly, right? Your mood, when it feels heavy, laughter will make you rise. And so, <laughs> you can have laughter that will help you quite extensively. So you will kill gravity. <laughs> almost in your mind through laughter I have learned to walk ever since I let myself run I have learned to fly ever since I do not want to be pushed before moving along so here is quite interesting people say walk before you run he said I learned how to walk when I let myself run then he contends he learned to fly since he didn't want to be pushed before moving along now I am light, now I fly, now I see myself beneath myself, now a god dances through me. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Now I see myself beneath myself. Hmm. Light beneath, well light emits a shadow. So if you can see the light and you see your shadow, you see yourself beneath yourself. You see the light and the dark. Quite fascinating. Really nerdy. So he used some aphorisms. And I did like how he was very witty when he said, You look up when you feel the need for elevation. And I look down because I am elevated. <laughs> oh, he's so sassy. And then he said that wisdom is a woman and loves only a warrior kind of hints at how being battle tested being this sort of warrior inside symbolically and literally through it you will engage with difficult circumstances and only through difficulty will you learn wisdom if life is breezy how can you ever elevate notice when he said peak to peak the highest mountains and to climb the highest mountains is quite difficult. To roam a hill is easier than to climb a peak. So he's connected his ideas quite extensively. That's why he said, in a mocking way, life is hard to bear. What he's telling us is that if you want to be elevated, be more like the donkey, don't be so tenderly. Don't shake like the rose when a drop of dew gets on it. Don't shake at such a little tiny thing in life but rather be a beast of burden like the donkey because humans are more like donkeys than the rosebud <laughs> fascinating